Good morning. And th there's always sunshine in my soul every time I uh, think about Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we are excited to invite you again, to welcome you again to our Sabbath School Study Guide. This morning, we want to welcome all our viewers that are watching us this morning uh, online. And, and we pray that you will uh, study with us this morning as we look at one, one important lesson this lesson is packed with so much material, and I encourage you all to take your Bibles and your study, Sabbath school study guide as we dig into Noble Prince of Peace. And before we get started, uh, again, quickly, we will have uh, a few minutes for the audience after each segment, and once our panelists have, you know, participated in, in those segments. And again, we'll be calling each one of us. Let's study together. Let's, uh, you know, read the Bible and, and, and help each, each one of us to grow and walk in the steps that the Lord wants us to. Uh, before we start, uh, we will introduce our panel here, and then we will ask uh, Elder Gus to open for us in prayer if we may introduce ourselves. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, my name is uh, Megas Chihaber. Um, what excites me today is we're talking about the noble uh, Prince of Peace, who is none other than that most powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kadia Carter. Um, I'm a member here. What excites me this week is just studying the word and acknowledging that during pain and suffering, God is still there with us. Good morning. My name is Sean. I'm a member here at Richardson, and um, I'm, uh, I like the lesson because it talks about the branch and the root, you know, going through the genealogies of who Jesus is and why it's important to us. Amen. And I'm your host and your Sabbath school superintendent. My name is Ali. Uh, Elder Gas, if you uh, please pray for us as we start. Let, 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 let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning that you have allowed us to be in your house to study your word. We ask that you give us spiritual eyes and spiritual ears so that we can understand your word. And also we ask for spiritual shoes so that we can walk in the path mm -hmm. that your word teaches us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So if you've been following the study guides, uh, we've been looking at the book of Isaiah and our lesson today is lesson five. Lesson five, and the title says, Noble Prince of Peace. Noble Prince of Peace. And our memory text is from the book of Isaiah chapter nine. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. And it says, for unto us a child is what? Born. Born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called what? Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Counselor. Might Mighty God, Everlasting, Everlasting Father, Father, and Prince of what? Peace. Peace. And let's go on in verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's, let's pause here for a second because today's lesson is going to help us to Find out whether the prince we are talking about is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if you remember last Sabbath, our brother there, Aka, had a question that he wanted proof whether the son who was being talked about in the book of Isaiah was pointing to who? To Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm glad to tell you that we have the answer here this morning. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so... The, the, the study, the, the study this morning uh, is about the one and only who can bring 
true and everlasting peace. True and everlasting peace. Let, let's pause there for a second. Do you think with all the superpowers that we have, with all the might men that dwell under the sun today, is there a man that can stand there and, and claim that he's going to bring peace in this world? <laughs> whether they've got a fat bank account, whether they've got uh, military welfare or weapons of war, there's just no man that can bring peace. And in every conversation you listen to these days, everybody is talking about, they, they just want peace. Everybody wants peace. And, but peace is not there. Mm -hmm. No man can bring peace. And, and so that's what we're going to study today. And so I want us to jump into a slide. Uh, slide number five. If you go to the next slide, number five. And the title here, if, you, if you're following us on Sunday, uh, says, End of Gloom for Galilee. End of gloom for Galilee. And we jump to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 9 and 20. And the Bible says, And when they say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? How would the living seek peace to the dead? And remember, this is a confusion that's going on here because when we started to study our lesson, we talked about King Ahaz and how he resorted into believing uh, false spirits, hoping that they can help him win the war and, and fight the battle. And he indulged himself in unclean acts of worship, disregarding the, the, the power that God had promised him and that God would give him. And so, and in verse 20, the Bible says, And to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to his word, it is because there is no light in them. Mm -hmm. You see, my friends, this morning, this lesson is so important to us because it gives us a contrast of truly understanding that God wants us to live a life that is clear a life that we can trust and believe him. And so, for a second here, I want to take you to the Bible here, Isaiah chapter 9, so we can contrast what's going on here. And as we move into Isaiah chapter 9, beginning to really figure out uh, this process of us understanding who is being talked about here. Nonetheless, in 9, Isaiah 9 verse 1, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the future, let me repeat that. In the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And Matthew chapter 4 verse 24. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various disease and torments and those who were demon-possessed and epileptic and paralytic, and he healed them. So we already see that the prophecy that is being talked about in the book of Isaiah is pointing to Christ, that, that only Christ was able to do these amazing things that the book of Isaiah is telling us. The wonderful counselor, the great physician, only him that can bring power. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I believe it's slide number six. And, 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 and uh, before we jump there, and I believe there's an interesting question here uh, on Sunday if you're following us. And it says, uh, if someone were to ask you, what has Jesus delivered you from? Mm -hmm. What would you answer? What personal testimony can you give regarding the power of Christ in your life? What personal situations can you hear? Can you witness, especially with all the turmoil around you? And, and, and there's a nice picture of a ship that you know, has lost its way in the middle of the waves in, in the oceans. And, and the ship is stuck there. And, and you've got to think first and say, okay, 
Now we've seen that the scripture is pointing to Christ. How do you connect the dots? Are there things that now make you feel comfortable where you are in your life to believe that, you know, Christ has come through in your life in so many ways? Because scripture here is pointing to Christ. Uh, and I want us to be thinking through these questions when we have a moment, you know, we'll discuss and give maybe some personal testimonies how the Lord has come through in your life. Let's jump on to the next slide here, which is slide number seven. And slide number seven says, a child for us on Monday uh, is, 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 is a child for us and only him who can bring a true and everlasting peace. And just as my panel will be commenting on here, I want to share this verse here who says, Who is this child with so many attributes that the Bible is talking about? Who is this child? And, and you and I know that there's no other child that has ever lived in this world with all these attributes that the, world is, the, the, the Bible is pointing to. The one and only who can bring true peace and true and everlasting peace. He is referred to as divine. Mm -hmm. He is referred to as what? Divine. divine. And the eternal creator, mm -hmm. the everlasting father. Mm -hmm. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of what? Mm -hmm. Of the Godhead bodily. Meaning, he is God. He is the one we are talking about in the book of Isaiah. There's no other person besides Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. The Bible says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said, Do not be afraid. I bring to you glad tidings, the good news that will cause great joy for all the people that dwell in the land. Today, in the town of David, a Messiah has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Amen? Amen. He Amen. is the Messiah, the Lord. The Bible is talking about Christ here. He is the he is Messiah, the Lord. And, and I want to open uh, this moment to my panelists here to chime in and, and, and tell us what they found on Sunday and Monday with regards to scripture describing who this baby is and, and what other lessons that you find here. Okay, let's start with the end of gloom for Galilee. Uh, if you look on the map out there, you're going to understand why the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali is the most affected. The Arameans or the Assyrians are the ones that are on the northeast. The, the land that is closest to them will be the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. So it was the most fertile land, and hence it makes sense that it was the most populous. Invasion from Syria would be very easy when you look at its position and of its obviously other strategies, including the fact that it's the most populous. So gloom did prevail for the land of, um, of Naphtali and the land of Zebulon. They were attacked and they were uh, taken, uh, rather they were deported into other lands, and other people came in to live into the land of Zebulun and into the land of Naphtali, who, who were Gentiles. So you look at this and you wonder, well, this land is now desolate. After being desolate, what happens is other people come in and live in this land. And yet, this is the gloom. Where is the end of the gloom? Who finishes the gloom will be the next slide. That's where you realize that, well, Christ, when he comes into picture, this is what he does to this land that is so desolate, the land that is infiltrated by strangers and other people who brought in other gods. In fact, when you look into the Bible, this is the place where most demons were, 
because of the practices. Remember, the Bible teaches us not to do uh, sorcery and all other black magic. But because these Gentiles came into the land and they started to practice those, this is the land that where most people were demon-possessed. So we look at Christ in the land of Zebulun or around that area. He, his parents were from Nazareth. Christ is born in Bethlehem, but his parents were from Nazareth. He lived in Capernaum. And the next thing, we talk about the wedding. The wedding, while it's, uh, many scholars argue where, we, where the village of Cana was, but they, they all agree that it is in the land of Zebulun. So Christ brings in, into the next slide, is where I want us to go in, and we ask the question, what can Emmanuel do? What can this child do? He's the noble prince of peace. He transforms a land, and if he can transform the land, well, he's in the business of salvation. He's in the business of transforming people. He's in the business of transforming our hearts. So that's where we come to, and I'll let the other panelists come in. Mm. So um, I'm going back to Sunday's lesson, we see where um, it's a perfect example of what happened then that is going to happen now. So we we'll look at how hopeless and distressed they were and how did they deal with it. So I'm, I'm trying to gauge us to look at it from our perspective in dealing with um, struggles that we're going through. How do we deal with struggles? And so I have like, um, I came up with like four ways we could look at this. Um, we, we all face trials and wrestle through struggles in life. And how should we view our struggles? How do you think we should view them? I believe that we should see them as ways that God is pruning us. He's preparing us for his kingdom, for his coming. So they are unpredictable. Our trials are unpredictable. They fall, they come unexpectedly. They're not the same many times. Sometimes they come in different ways. Sometimes they, they hit us down in some ways that we don't see a future. But just like how those people were back in, in that time, they felt hopeless. That's the same way some of us are. Even in this time, in COVID-19, a lot of people, they have lost their jobs. They, they have no food. They, they are struggling to find their way out. And how, how I'm recommending that we look at this is we consider it joy, as in um, joy whenever we face trials. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that it's good you get to suffer. I'm sorry. It's good you get to suffer because when you suffer, it helps you to grow. It strengthens you to become stronger. It helps you to face whatever else is coming down the road. And just remember that God is always in control. In Psalm 55, verse 22, he says, cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. He also promises deliverance, just like the people back then. Their gloom was ended. He promises deliverance and eternal blessing. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him and endureth the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And what does God want to produce in you through your struggles? That's my question to you. What do you think he wants to do? I believe he wants to purify our faith. He wants to develop perseverance in you. Mm. Your trials cultivate your maturity and your character in growing in Christ. That's what I got from today's from Sunday's lesson. Amen. 
So looking at uh, the Monday part of it, you know, I want to look at what was taking place before this child was born. Mm -hmm. If you read uh, Isaiah 9, starting in verse 2, it says, The people walked in darkness, have seen a great light. The, the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine. Thou hast multiplied the nation, verse 3, not increased the joy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of turbulence that happened in Israel. Uh, Judah, namely, they were oppressed, you know, they, the Greeks had taken control, the Medo-Persians, and, and the Romans were in control, and they were oppressed people. And so and it goes all the way down to verse 6, and for unto us a child is born, you know, unto us a son is given. So it's like before this child comes, there's oppression. And I want to link that to Isaiah 7.14. And verse 15, and I know there were some questions on this, you know, namely verse 15, like butter and honey shall he eat. That can't refer to Christ, but I said it does refer to Christ, and this is why. Um, you read Prophets and Kings, page 695, paragraph 1. Ellen White herself, under inspiration, says Isaiah 7, 14 and 15 refers to Christ himself. So knowing that refers to Christ where it says butter and honey shall he eat so he shall uh, know how to refuse the good and evil and then uh, verse 16 it says before this happens he uh, the land will be forsaken of both her kings and before Christ was born you know Damascus uh, her, that king was done away with uh, Israel we know the ten northern tribes were done away with and so, and it's talking about, and you go down the rest of verse 7, there is God saying, there's going to be so much abundance of food because there's not going to be anyone there left. And so, just tying that in, before Christ came, Israel was suffering so much. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, the angels, when they saw the shepherds, they said, rejoice, rejoice. Salvation has come to you. Darkness Amen. is changed. Light has come. God is putting an end to all this. So uh, it was just a wonderful uh, section of the lesson, and I'm glad that light is still shining today. Amen. 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 Do, do we have a comment from the audience? Uh, otherwise, we'll be moving on. Yes. Do we, can we get the microphone there, please? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I was listening to what you were saying, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's so true in today's world. And what I find blessings in, in hard times oh, and, yes. and, and in the good times, mm -hmm. the scripture that came to my mind is, and we're so guilty of this so many times, is the storms of life keep our eyes sometimes not focused on Christ. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And whenever Peter, he said, let me come to you, Lord. And he starts to walk on the water and he starts to think. Mm -hmm. Well, he's thinking because he took his eyes off the Father. Yeah. And when we get in those troubled times, we take our eyes off the Father. Mm -hmm. and Amen. It's hard to do. It struggles for right. all of us in yeah. some type or form. Right. And we mm -hmm. have to, every night when I, when I find I can't sleep, mm -hmm. my words, I whisper to myself, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen. Because mm -hmm. I know he can give me the rest yes. mm -hmm. to help me face those struggles the next day. Amen. So Amen. keep our eyes focused in this special time of our life. Amen. Thank you so Such much. A good point. Amen. Amen. Thank Any you. other questions or comments? Monday's so, lesson. I just wanted to um, repeat um, Romans 12, verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be mm. patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Mm. And um, to James 1, 2 to 3, consider it sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you Amen. from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith Life is forced into the open and show its true colors. Amen. That brings us into Tuesday. I think you can 
Oh. Yes, I have Tuesday's lesson. Yes. Yes. Moving on to Tuesday's lesson, um, we talk about the rod of God's anger. And so I just wanted to, um, to go from the perspective. In Isaiah 10, verse 5, well, um, that's, well, 10, verse 5 to 11 tells us, can you go to slide, um, what slide is this? My first slide, right, oh, it's not very bright, I'm sorry. I'll just read it for you. Um, it tells us that as the Assyrians, well, the Assyrian, he was hailed as God's instrument of judgment upon Israel. Mm. But in his arrogance, he claims that he was the one who had the power and he, everything was done from his strength. But he failed to recognize that God was using his, him, God was using him as a way to chastise Israel. And when the purpose was achieved, that he himself would be destroyed too. And so the Assyrians were considered by the Israelites as the great prototype of God's greatest enemies because of his boastful, his boastful ways, his claims, and his pride, and his arrogance. Isaiah 10, verse 23, 20 to 23, tells us about a vision of, far, of the far distant future when Israel will have learned the lesson of this judgment and return to their land of peace and prosperity. And it moves on in Isaiah 10, verse 24 to 27, where God appealed to Israel to have no fear of the Assyrian, but to rest upon him in faith. As through this faith, the rest of the chapter from verses 28 to 34 is a vivid description of the manner in which the invading armies will advance, but they will be destroyed. Why? Because God, is, he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us unto destruction. Even though we are rebellious, he's always going to be there for us. So I was looking at the rod of God's anger. And so I wanted to point out the rod. What does a rod signify? There are many different types of rods. Could you move on to slide... Um, Yes, that one. There are many different types of rods. You have a birch rod, which is made from tree twigs, and it was used as a form of corporal punishment. Um, you have a ceremonial rod that was used to indicate position of authority. You have the connecting rod. You have the control rod. You have the divining rod, the fishing rod, the lightning rod, the measuring rod, the truss rod, all of these rods. But... What does the rod of God's anger signify? Could you move to the next slide? Um, what do you think it signifies? I believe it signifies, um, in Israel, their culture was that the rod signifies authority. The shepherd used it to guide and correct the flock. That You could find that in James, um, Psalm 23, verse 4. Moses used his rod to tend to his sheep, Exodus 4, verse 2. And later, in Exodus 4, verse 20, there, the, Moses used it as authority over the Israelites. Aaron also, his rod was used as a miraculous power where it was thrown and it turned into the serpent who swallowed all the other rods. What does God, this rod that um, of God's anger represent? It represents a symbol of our protection. It was used to defend, the rod itself was used to defend the sheep and the predators. God defends us. He goes before us against our enemies. And we can find that 
reference in Isaiah 41, verse 10 to 12, Isaiah 54, verse 17. It's also a symbol of love, God's unrelenting love for us. And that's in Psalm 23, verse 4. If you go back to Psalm 23, verse 4, everyone knows that. That's our favorite psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So what does that mean? God hit the rod was used as our protection, and it's not really a rod of punishment. It's a symbol of love. When you love your kids and they do wrong, you punish them. Why do you punish them? Because you want to teach them, you want to groom them in the right way. And it's not that you, you're, you're punishing them because they deserve to be punished. It's because you want them to be better. So that's what God, is, God was doing to those people. God allowed his people to suffer because they would not turn away from their iniquities. He wanted them to repent of their sins and seek him. Their suffering came in four stages. It was the war. Could you turn to slide? Um, yes. The war on their land. I can't, can't see that. <laughs> Sorry. But it came in four stages. Hmm. Can't see it. But, um, so, but in his wisdom, he used the consequences of our disobedience to teach us the lessons we need and to demonstrate his love for us. He allows us to suffer, but he will be there with us through it all. Why would a loving God punish his people? He gives us freedom to choose. He treats us as individuals. He gave us he gave the Israelites freedom to choose whether they obey him or not. Another reason I think he, um, he punishes us, well, not really punished, but allows us to suffer, is because he wants us to have that responsibility. He wants us to prepare us. So I would like to put it out to my panel. What did you glean from Tuesday's lesson? So Tuesday's lesson, how many of you have heard, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me? <laughs> or is it the other way around? <laughs> you know, like being spanked is not fun. You know, I, if any of you know what the switch is, I do. If you don't, ask somebody who's old school. You know, I know what spankings are very well. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's just like, you know, in my personal relationship with God, you know, I, I'm struggling sometimes when I look at him. I'm like, Lord, why are you punishing me? Was it really that bad? You know, and, I'm, 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 and I come to the conclusion, I don't know the full enormity of sin. You know, the, the stripes that Christ took were, you know, that was just one part of it. You know, he, he took so much. And when we look at the cross, the more we look at the cross, we understand why God is trying everything he can to save us. So you go to Proverbs twenty two fifteen. It says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Yes. You know, I know it's like we say it so often, but how many of you had a garden or have a garden? And, and you till the soil, and you just and you plant your plants, and you let them grow. Do weeds grow, or do you have a special garden that weeds don't grow? You know, if you don't do something, those weeds will choke that plant out, or some other uh, um, some other varmint's going to come and do something to it. So the rod of God, you read in uh, Psalms eighty nine, <clears throat> around verse twenty. It says, I will punish them with the rod of iniquity, you know, for your, uh, the rod for their iniquities. And you're like, wow, you know, God, you really were harsh on them. But you know what? Uh, mm -hmm. Proverbs 20, verse uh, 29, uh, verse 30, it says, the blueness of a wound cleanses away evil. Uh, and so 
I was talking to uh, Maxwell, and you know he does a lot of um, uh, wound care and whatever. If you want to heal that tissue, you have to start cutting away the dead tissue around it, and that hurts. It's not fun. But until it gets that beefy red appearance, I'm not trying to gross you out, but I'm just trying to make this illustration. When it gets that beefy red uh, uh, appearance, then its growth can happen. You know, it can start healing in the normal process, uh, can start happening. And, you know, in Hosea 13, in verse uh, uh, 9, I believe it says, you know, Israel, you have destroyed yourself. Mm -hmm. And when we look at it, we're the ones that bring these consequences on us. We're the ones that run away from God and the devil's sitting there waiting to beat us up. And so we deal with all the, those consequences. Like First Peter 2, 20 says, how, uh, you know, what good is it if you're buffeted for your own sins? You know, so we're the ones to blame and God you know it says those that I love Revelation 319 those that I love I chasten and it's because we're children and God's trying to save us he's trying to get that goodness out of us and like that switch when I remember that painful spanking I'm like you know what I'm not going to do that because that hurt I'm not going to do that <laughs> and I, I actually love my parents for spanking me after, you know, 20 years, but, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I really respect them for uh, taking that stance. Uh, any other questions for uh, Tuesday's lesson or comments? Yes. A comment there. Uh, if we can get him the mic mm -hmm. right up there. So for our speakers, if we can make our comments short in the interest of time. Happy Sabbath to all. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I see the wrath of God. Uh, Two ways. First, mm -hmm. he uses to punish mm -hmm. the enemies of his uh, people. And uh, also, uh, when we stray from God, mm -hmm. we punish ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I go out with my grandkids to a playground, I, I, I say to them, if I cannot see you, I cannot protect you. Mm. And that's what happens. Yeah. We have to keep our eye on our captain, Jesus Christ, Amen. to follow his sample, to be like him. Mm. But if we stay away from God mm. so far, mm -hmm. we lose his protection. Amen. Because the Bible says, under his wings, mm -hmm. we are protected. Amen. 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 Thank you. Oh, good point. So I just want to wrap up Tuesday's lesson. Um, why would, uh, following up from why would God punish his people, I found three reasons. Because he respects us, he wants to give us the responsibility, and he wants to prepare us. So prepare us, pain in God, pain in us suffering is not a payback. It's not God's payback for our sins or the sins that we've committed. It's, it's, he doesn't find joy in that. I believe that us suffering is, is um, he's, he's not getting even with us because he says in Psalm 103 verse 10, hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far he hath removed our transgressions from us. So he's not chastising us. He's not getting even with us. What he's doing, he's preparing us. He's pruning us. It's not like a punishment. It's a process of great promotion. He's preparing us for something better. He said in James 1, verse 2 to 4, count it all joy, my brothers, and when you meet trials of various kinds, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So... When we go through that pain, when we go through that, those trials, 
just count it as a, just try to learn from it what you must, because in the end, you are going to be promoted. You are going to have something more valuable, more worthwhile. He, and remember, he will never give you more than you can bear. He promised to strengthen you, help you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Throughout all that is the Israelites endured, the verse that stood out to me was that his hand was outstretched still. He was still there. Moving on to Wednesday's lesson. Okay, so Wednesday's lesson dealing with roots and branches, you know, and let's just, uh, we're just going to go through what does the Bible say about Christ as the root or the branch, or, or does that apply to him? So we'll go to slide 26. Um, here is a tree, which Paul Burnett, he's 40 years old, he spent 25 years growing this tree that has 250 different varieties of apples on it. Now you say, how can a horticulturalist do this? It's the process of grafting, mm -hmm. and grafting in a branch. Paul actually uses this analogy in Romans chapter 11, verses 19-21, saying those that are you know, Gentiles can be grafted in and become the branches, you know, of Christ. But, you know, let's look at what is the branch. And the lesson brings out Jeremiah 33, 15, um, which I'll read to you really quick. It says, in those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Who's the branch? Who's the branch? Now, and, and he specifies of David. And if you look at um, the prophecy given, and Jacob gave this to his sons, in Genesis 49, verse 10, it says, to uh, speaking of the tribe of Judah, to him will be the gathering of the people. And mm -hmm. it talks, he will, be, he, he, he will drink milk, his teeth will be white, uh, and he'll drink the wine. Uh, he, you know, symbolizing he will be the chiefest. And it says, this is the branch of righteousness uh, uh, that, will be, that will grow up unto David. And so looking at Zechariah 6, 12, it says that, you know, Christ will be, he will be a ruler. He will be a high priest. He is the branch. He'll be a high priest and uh, he will execute judgment. Well, who in the Bible is authorized to execute judgment? And uh, you read in John chapter 5, verse 22, it says, judgment is given to the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. And so the Son of Man is given judgment, and only he can execute judgment. Yes, we're all fruit inspectors, you know, like 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 says, don't you know we will judge angels? But we're talking about, you know, you're going to heaven or to hell, that judgment is given unto God. And praise the Lord, because if any one of us were judging each other, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. there would be some empty places in heaven. <laughs> All right, let's move on to roots. Go to the next slide. This is the Methuselah pine. I've mentioned it before. Uh, I'm going to tell you the gospel about the Methuselah pine. This is the oldest uh, species of trees or living organism. They go back to the flood. They're, over, they're about 4,000 years old. Um, and so this pine tree, uh, you can find them in the uh, northern California. And talking about the roots, I want to talk about the roots. Romans 1.3 says, you know, Christ is from the root and uh, offspring of David. And you can read that in Revelation 22.16. But to explain this with this tree, when this tree, if it has another uh, Methuselah pine tree next to it, and it realizes the other tree has a better chance of survival, it will give its roots over to them, and they will become grafted into mm. that tree so mm. it will survive. And though it dies, it's passing on life to uh, the next wow. tree. And that's what Christ has done for us. He, he came here to give his life a ransom for many. And so 
when he's saying, hey, I want to graft you in. I want to graft you into my, to the vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm-hmm. I will give my life. Uh, uh, you read in um, John chapter 12, verse 28, it says, unless the seed dies, it re- abideth alone. But, I mean, if a seed doesn't die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it gives growth to everything. And that's what Christ has done. Mm. He has given his roots. He's given his life for us that we might have life more abundantly. So with that, I want to open it up to the panel, and uh, we'll take comments or questions after that. Yes. Okay. So, um, well, the root and branch in one. Could you go to my slide, please? Um, there's something that really proves that Christ is the complete salvation package. He's the root in other scripture. He's the vine. He's the branch. Uh, for a complete meal, he is the bread and the wine. Uh, for those who seek protection, he is the shepherd and the door. Uh, for those who want complete worship, he is the priest, he is the sacrifice, and he is the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. He is the successor and predecessor of David. He is everything, and sometimes I feel like Christ is taking everything. He Amen. really is. Mm-hmm. He's showing you, I am. I am the complete salvation package. No one comes to me, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Mm-hmm. He is everything. And in Revelation, he even says this, I am Aleph and Tav, uh, which is in the Hebrew, and in the, uh, in the Greek, it's uh, Alpha and Omega, and in English, it's A and Z. So Christ is everything. The next slide truly shows us who this is. Mm-hmm. He is Emmanuel. He is uh, Jesus. Salvation is through him. There is no salvation in no one else, for there mm-hmm. is no Amen. other name Amen. under heaven mm-hmm. given to mankind whom we must be saved. Amen. There is no other name. The complete salvation package is through Christ. He is the root and the branch. And, I, I, and, and we can argue with so many points and we we come to the realization that Christ is the complete package mm-hmm. of our salvation and we thank God for that. Amen. 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 Yes. Uh, let's see you the last few remaining minutes to Thursday. Elder Gus, go ahead. Okay, going on to the Thursday lesson, you comforted me. And uh, the name Isaiah itself, and I think I've mentioned this before, Isaiah, Josiah, and Joshua, and Jesus are actually, they stem from the same root, meaning that God is the healer, God is salvation, salvation belongs to him, Emmanuel, meaning that he became, he came to dwell among us, mm-hmm. he became a sin for us, he, not only did he carry our sins, but he actually became the sin for us, mm-hmm. not only is he Uh, Does he bring peace to us? But he actually is the prince of peace. The root of Jesse becomes everything. The next slide. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, I like it because it says it's by God's grace. It's not by my doing. It's not anything that I contribute without earning it. We are all granted the status of being considered righteous before him through the act of redeeming us from our enslavement to sin that was accomplished by the Messiah, Yeshua. That's the uh, uh, CJB, the uh, version of the Bible. The next slide, please. He is the noble prince of peace. In Isaiah chapter 12, after all he has done this, we see the road of God. We also see he's the root and the branch. He is the noble prince of peace. He is in the business of, transform, of transformation, changing a land that was so desolate, changing hearts that are broken, mending them and creating new hearts. This is the business that Christ is. So when we look at what Christ has done for us, Emmanuel, God among us, uh, God is reaching out to us. What do we do? We go to Isaiah chapter 12. Mm-hmm. Isaiah chapter 12 is a psalm, and the psalm in the Hebrew is Tehillim. Tehillim, which means a sacred hymn. It's not just a hymn. It's a hymn, and just like many other hymns that you have heard, they are hymns of praise. I'm going to read uh, this, this, uh, this psalm 
found in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 12, starting from verse 1, in that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Yahweh, for though you were angry with me, your anger has turned away. You comforted me. We talked about the road of God, and now that same road, according to David, is a comfort. Doesn't it comfort? Uh, uh, Psalms uh, 23, verse 4. Your anger has turned away. You comfort me, for his anger is not an everlasting anger. Behold, God is my salvation. That word is coming back. I will trust and will not be afraid. For Yah, uh, my name is Magus. I go by Gus sometimes. So Yah. His full name is Yahweh, and Yah is his short, which means the intimacy that really God wants us to, to reach out to say, for Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Verse 3, therefore, with joy, you will draw water out of the wells of salvation. Remember last week we talked about the wells. We talked about the waters that people made a choice uh, to get the waters from Assyria, which were stronger than what God gives. God gives us uh, the waters, the waters, the walls of salvation, the waters of our salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to Yahweh, call in his name, declare his doing among these people, mm -hmm. proclaim that his name is exalted. Holy one of Israel is great among you. Verse four. Sing to Yahweh, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known to all the earth. This is the message we should be spreading. This is the gospel we should be spread. To sing to Yahweh, for he has done what great things, for he has done marvelous things. Mm -hmm. Cry aloud and shout, you inhabited of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is great among you. The next slide. All I can say is hallelujah, Amen. which means praise Yah. Sing to the Lord, praise him, glory be to God for the great things he has done. For he gave us his son to die for us. He gave us his son to bring peace. He gave us his son not only to chasten, but to actually show the love and to protect us. May Yahweh's name be glorified and may you be comforted with these words. If you'd allow me the last slide, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Mm. Yes. Mm. Man, mm. Mm. what can I say to that? Um, but God is the comfort of all comforts. He, his comforts, you can find that in the Savior, as Gus just said, in, in Christ coming to die for us, when he was with his disciples, he, he comforted them. But he died for our sins, and now he's interceding on our behalf. Even so, we are still always being comforted, knowing that he's always there for us. And um, the second comfort is in the Spirit. Before, because... If, if you read um, John 14, verse 16, verse 16 to 18, it talks about the Lord's promise that after his departure, he will send the Holy Spirit to carry on the ministry of comfort. And so he's always here with us. And um, his comfort, it's... We can find comfort also in the scriptures. How much do we know our personal experience about comfort in the scriptures? It says, God, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing the asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What does that mean? That we can find comfort in everything. It's the, like Gus said, it's the complete package. We have no wants in, we lack nothing. Amen. Well, uh, now that we know who the child is, and thank you again, Brother Gus, for uh, demonstrating uh, what scripture says here 
Uh, John chapter 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has mm. eternal life. Amen. Amen. Mm. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not shall not see life. So Christ is a full package. Mm. And, and that's what we need. Mm. If we go to slide 45, um, the, there's a nice uh, sort of how... Redemption is described here because we've now identified and, and what do we find in Christ? It is the process of allowing God to drive change in our lives, setting aside our own plans so we can focus on following his plans. Many of us, when we buy equipment or maybe we are doing something, there's always some instructions or a plan that we need to follow. And Jesus is giving us the plan we are here. He says, forsake your ways and follow my ways. And once you believe in the Son, you will have eternal life. And if we jump to the next slide, that and you agree with me, mm. that once upon a time, you and I, we were shackled in chains. Mm -hmm in chains, but now we are free. He has brought us out of darkness mm -hmm. and freed us from our chains. Hallelujah. Amen. Because Jesus is the only one that can bring the peace, the freedom, the happiness, the joy that the lesson is talking about. Amen. The next slide. And once upon a time, me and I, we were blind. Mm -hmm. And, and when Jesus reached out and touched me, he touched your eyes. He touched my eyes. Mm -hmm. And we see our eyes now can see the, the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. As you can see now that Christ is standing right in the middle of our eyes. Mm -hmm. and, and he wants us to demonstrate this light unto others. And so as we wrap up our lesson here, I know... It's crunch time. Let me give 30 seconds to each panelist here to just give us their closing word. Again, we apologize. Next Sabbath, we'll try and start on time to make sure that uh, we can all participate as we do every Sabbath. Brother Gus. Uh, for me, uh, in closing, I will simply say, look to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. There is so much gloom. He can transform our lives. He can change our lives. So let's look to him, the complete salvation package. Yeah. For closing, I just want to read um, Ellen G. White thoughts from, from the Mount of Blessing, chapter 2, page 27. Christ is the Prince of Peace, mm -hmm. the Isaiah 9, verse 6, and it is his mission to restore to earth and heaven the peace that sin has broken. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our God, Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1, whoever consents to renounce sin and open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of the heavenly peace. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Uh, Isaiah 32, 17, it says, the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect thereof is quietness and assurance forever. Let's let the Prince of Peace reign in mm. our hearts. Amen. 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 John 10, 28. Did I see a hand there? Okay. John 28, 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Mm -hmm. One preacher said, you have Christ, you have life. Amen. Amen. You have no Christ, you have no life. Amen. Let's live Christ every day, every hour, my friends, and again, may the good Lord bless us uh, we'll try and start on time next Sabbath to make sure we can bring in all the comments. God bless you. Brother Sean, pray for us. Amen. Kind, loving Father, Lord, thank you so much for coming to this dark world and shining the light mm -hmm. so that we can see the way to go, Lord. And you say, apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. So help us to focus our vision upon you, especially in this time where turmoil's all around us. We can have peace in the midst of the storm. Continue to bless the rest of your service. Amen. 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 Amen.